Here is part two of Charlotte's Web, chapter 10, An Explosion. Day after day, the spider waited, head down, for an idea to come to her. Hour by hour, she sat motionless, deep in thought. Having promised Wilbur that she would save his life, she was determined to keep her promise. Charlotte was naturally patient. She knew from experience that if she waited long enough, a fly would come to her web, and she felt sure that if she thought long enough about Wilbur's problem, an idea would come to her mind. Finally, one morning, toward the middle of July, the idea came. Why, how perfectly simple, she said to herself. The way to save Wilbur's life is to play a trick on Suckerman. If I can fool a bug, thought Charlotte, I can surely fool a man. People are not as smart as bugs. Mm, I think I found an answer to a question that we have. Wilbur walked into his yard just at that moment. What are you thinking about, Charlotte? He asked. I was just thinking, said the spider, that people are very gullible. What does gullible mean? Easy to fool, said Charlotte. That's a mercy, replied Wilbur, and he lay down in the shade of his fence and went fast asleep went fast asleep. The spider, however, stayed wide awake, gazing affectionately at him and making plans for his future. Summer was half gone. She knew she didn't have much time. That morning, just as Wilbur fell asleep, Avery Arable wandered into Zuckerman's front yard, followed by Fern. Avery carried a live frog in his hand. Fern had a crown of daisies in her hair. The children ran for the kitchen. Just in time for a piece of blueberry pie said Mrs. Zuckerman. Look at my frog, said Avery, placing the frog on the drain board and holding out his hand for pie. Take that thing out of here, said Mrs. Zuckerman. He's hot, said Fern. He's almost dead, that frog. He is not, said Avery. He lets me scratch him between the eyes. The frog jumped and landed in Mrs. Zuckerman's dishpan full of soapy water. And a dishpan is just like a giant bucket where they do their dishes. You're getting pie on you said Fern. Can I look for eggs in the hen house, Elliot? Run outdoors, both of you, and don't bother the hens. It's getting all over everything, shouted Fern. His pie is all over his front. Come on, frog, cried Avery. He scooped up his frog. The frog kicked, splashing soapy water onto the blueberry pie. Another crassus, groaned Fern. Let's swing in the swing, said Avery. The children ran to the barn. Mr. Zuckerman had the best swing in the county, and you guys will see why. It was, a, it was a single long piece of heavy rope tied to the beam over the north doorway. At the bottom of the rope was a fat knot to sit on. It was arranged so that you could swing without being pushed. You climbed to the ladder to the hayloft, and in the hayloft it's at the top of the barn. You had to climb a ladder to get there. Then, holding the rope, you stood at the edge and looked down, and you were scared and dizzy. Then you straddled the knot so that it acted as a seat. Then you got up all your nerve, took a deep breath, and jumped. For a second, you seemed to be falling to the barn floor far below. Then suddenly, the rope would begin to catch you, and you would sail through the barn door going a mile a minute, with the wind whistling in your ear, eyes and ears and hair. Then you would zoom upward into the sky and look up at the clouds, and the rope would twist, and you would twist and turn with the rope. Then you would drop down, down, down out of the sky, and come sailing back into the barn, almost into the hayloft, then sail out again. Not quite so far this time. Then in again, not quite so high. Then out again, then in again, then out, then in. Then you jump off and fall down and let somebody else try. Mothers for miles around worried about Zuckerman's swing. They feared some child would fall off but no child ever did. Children almost always hang on to things tighter than their parents think they will. <laughs> I don't know about that. Avery put the frog in his pocket and climbed to the hayloft. <clears throat> last time, the last time I swang in this swing, I almost crashed into the barn swallow, he yelled. Take that frog out, ordered Fern, and you're going to see the swing. So what they do is they grab the rope and they climb up the ladder and into the hayloft. And then from the top of the hayloft, they hold onto the rope and they jump down and they swing out of the barn door and in and just like that. They that go like that. Fun, actually. That sounds scary. 
But of course, I am a mom, so I worry just as much as the moms in the book do. But to the children, Lily, sounds fun? Yeah. Yeah, not so much. I don't know. Avery straddled the rope and jumped. He sailed out through the door, frog and all, and into the sky, frog and all. Then he sailed back into the barn. Your tongue is purple, screamed Fern. So is yours, cried Avery, sailing out again with the frog. I have hay inside my dress. It itches, called Fern. Scratch it, yelled Avery as he sailed back. It's my turn, said Fern. Jump off. Fern's got an itch, sang Avery. When he jumped off, he threw the swing up to his sister. She shut her eyes tight and jumped. She felt the dizzy drop, then the supporting lift of the swing. When she opened her eyes, she was looking up into the blue sky and was about to fall back through the door. They took turns for an hour. When the children grew tired of swinging, they went down toward the pasture and picked wild raspberries and ate them. Their, turn, their tongues turned from purple to red. Fern bit into a raspberry that had a bad-tasting bug inside it and got discouraged. Avery found an empty candy box and put his frog in it. The frog seemed tired after his morning in the swing. The children walked slowly up toward the barn. They too were tired and hardly had enough energy, energy enough to walk. Let's build a tree house, suggested Avery. I want to live in a tree with my frog. I'm going to visit Wilbur, Fern announced. They climbed the fence into the lane and walked lazily toward the pig pen. Wilbur heard them coming and got up. Avery noticed the spider web and, coming closer, he saw Charlotte. Hey, look at that big spider, he said. It's tremendous. Leave it alone, commanded Fern. You've got a frog. Isn't that enough? It's a fine spider and I'm going to capture it, said Avery. Well, I found another answer. He took the cover off the candy box. Then he picked up a stick. I'm going to knock that old spider into this box, he said. Wilbur's heart almost stopped when he saw what was going on. This might be the end of Charlotte if the boy succeeded in catching her. You stop it, Avery, cried Fern. Avery put one leg over the fence of the pig pen. He was just about to raise his stick to hit Charlotte when he lost his balance. He swayed and toppled and landed on the edge of Wilbur's trough. The trough tipped up, so it tipped up like this, and then came down with a slap. The goose egg was right underneath that dud egg. Oh. There was a dull explosion as the egg broke and then a horrible smell. Fern screamed. Avery jumped to his feet. The air was filled with terrible gases and smells from the rotten egg. Templeton, who had been resting in his home, scuttled away into the barn. Good night, screamed Avery. Good night, what a stink. Let's get out of here. Fern was crying. She held her nose and ran toward the house. Avery ran after her, holding his nose. Charlotte felt greatly relieved to see him go. It had been a narrow escape. Later on that morning, the animals came up from the pasture. The sheep, the lambs, the, go the gander, the goose, and the seven goslings. There were many complaints about the awful smell, and Wilbur had to tell the story over and over again of how the arable boy had tried to capture Charlotte and how the smell of the broken egg drove him away just in time. It was that rotten goose egg that saved Charlotte's life, said Wilbur. The goose was proud of her share in the adventure. I'm, delight I'm delighted that egg never hatched, she gabbled. Templeton, of course, was miserable over the loss of his beloved egg, but he couldn't resist boasting. It pays to save things, he said in his surly voice. A rat never knows when something is going to come in handy. I never throw anything away. <laughs> I don't know, guys. I can't imagine holding on to every single bit of trash. Never throwing anything away? Uh, I don't know. Well, said one of the lambs, this whole business is all well and good for Charlotte, but what about the rest of us? This smell is unbearable. Who wants to live in a barn that is perfumed with rotten egg? Don't worry, you'll get used to it, said Templeton. He sat up and pulled wisely at his long whiskers, then crept away to pay a visit to the dump. When Lurvy showed up at lunchtime carrying a pail of food for Wilbur, he stopped short a few paces from the pig pen. 
He sniffed the air and made a face. What in thunder? He said. Setting the pail down, he picked up the stick that Avery had dropped and pried the trough up. Rats, he said. Phew! I might have known a rat would have made a nest under this trough. How I hate a rat. And Lurvy dragged Wilbur's trough across the yard and kicked some dirt into the rat's nest, burying the broken egg and all Templeton's other possessions. Then he picked up the pail. Wilbur stood in the trough, drooling with hunger. Lur Lurvy poured. The slops ran creamily down the pig's eyes and ears. Wilbur grunted. He gulped and sucked and sucked and gulped, making swishing and swooshing noises, anxious to get everything at once. It was a delicious meal. Skim milk, wheat middlings, leftover pancakes, half a donut, the rind of a summer squash, two pieces of stale toast, a third of a ginger snap, a fishtail, one orange peel, several noodles from a noodle soup, the scum of a cup of cocoa, an ancient jelly roll, a strip of paper from the lining of a garbage pail, and a spoonful of raspberry jello. Wilbur ate heartily. He planned to leave half a noodle and a few drops of milk for Templeton. Then he remembered that the rat had been useful in saving Charlotte's life, and that Charlotte was trying to save his life. So he left a whole noodle instead of half. Now that the broken egg was buried, the air cleared, and the barn cellar and the barn smelled good again. The afternoon passed, and evening came. Shadows lengthened. The cool and kindly breath of evening entered through doors and windows. Astride her web, Charlotte sat moodily, eating a horsefly and thinking about a future. After a while, she bestirred herself. She descended, descended to the center of the web, and there she began to cut some of her lines. She worked slowly but steadily while the other creatures drowsed. None of the others, not even the goose, noticed that she was at work. Deep in his soft bed, Wilbur snoozed over in their favorite corner. The gosling whistle, goslings whistled a night song. Charlotte tore quite a section out of her web, leaving an open space in the middle. Then she started weaving something to take the place of the thread she removed. When Templeton got back from the dump, after midnight, the spider was still at work. And that is the end of chapter 10. Now let's take a look at our questions. Charlotte says at the beginning of the book that people are very gullible. And Wilbur asked her what that meant. And she said that people who are gullible are people who are easily fooled. So gullible. Both means easily fooled. And it could also mean when people are gullible, it means they just believe everything, everything, okay? So gullible means easily fooled and that you believe everything. <laughs> so if I were to say something like, oh yeah, I have $10 million dollars. If you are gullible enough to believe it, or if you believe it, it means that you're gullible, okay? Of course, it's not true. $10 million, I wish. So make a list of three things that Fern and Avery do together that afternoon, and that one that I'm thinking of, of course, is that swinging in the barn, right? Swinging in the barn, oh boy. Can you remember anything else? Right, they went to go pick raspberries. And they also went to the hen house, right? So I'm gonna put that one in here. Went to the hen house. They also ate blueberry pie. They went to go visit Wilbur. So any one of those things you could have put in there, okay? But if you'd like to copy mine, that would be fine. Pause the video if you need to get caught up. Okay, here we go. On number three, we're gonna draw a line to match the quote with which character who said it. People are not as smart as bugs. I think you already know who it was, right? 
It was Charlotte, and that's what she said at the beginning of the chapter. I'm going to visit Wilbur. Would be Fern, and that Avery. That's a fine spider, and I'm going to capture it. That is what he said, right? And let's go to the back. So the effect, remember, cause and effect. Something has to happen, and the effect is why it happened, okay? Or what, what came of it after this particular event happened. So the effect was Avery lost his balance and landed on Wilbur's trough. Well, why did he lose his balance in the first place? What was the cause? What was he trying to do? You're right. Avery was trying to capture um, Charlotte. And because of it, he lost his balance and landed on Wilbur's trough. You see how that cause and effect worked? So let's go down here. The egg broke. That was the cause. What was the effect of that broken egg, guys? You're right. The whole barn smelled. The whole barn smelled up and the children ran away, right? So that's something we can write there too. The children ran away. Pause the video if you need to catch up with me. All right, and the last thing. We don't know what the cause is, but the cause led to this effect. Lurvy covered up Templeton's nest. Now he did that because what happened? You're right, because Lurvy smelled the broken egg. Lurvy smelled the broken egg and saw Templeton's lair. And because he did, he covered up his nest. And that's it for Chapter 10, boys and girls. Make sure you finish this in your packet, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye. I hope you enjoyed the chapter. It was a good one.